Hi, my name is Tamo Nakahara. Um, I run the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. Uh, this is our Weave online user group. Uh, this is the first time we're doing, I think, from sheltered place where we've set a little nook here. And I hope that you are all um, safe and doing okay. And hopefully, um, this will be some of the ways that our Weave online user group will be some of the ways that you can uh, learn some stuff and uh, be able to take the time uh, during the shelter in place time, or at least we have shelter in place here uh, in the San Francisco area, uh, whatever version you have where you live. Um, if this is your first time coming to the Weave Online User Group, welcome. This is a series that uh, we've done at this season every two weeks. So um, every Tuesday at this time, which is 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, and evenings and afternoons and other places in the globe. We uh, have guest speakers uh, like today. We're very lucky to have uh, Jason Epstein from Morantis. Uh, we've had other speakers and um, people from our developer experience team. So if this is new, then uh, welcome and yeah, check us out. Uh, we'll share with you where you can find the calendar of events where we have a variety of new stuff uh, coming up. We have uh, Stacy here who's behind the Weaveworks logo. She's the one who's been curating this fantastic series. So she'll be posting the updates. I'm also saying some familiar faces saying hello. So it's great to see you again. I hope you guys are all staying safe. So today, uh, like I said, we're lucky to have Jason Epstein, who's uh, at, uh, who was on the Docker Enterprise team and so now is at Mirantis. So he'll be talking about uh, security uh, and security details for um, doing DevOps, Kubernetes uh, container work. So we're very lucky to have him as a guest. Uh, before we get started, I'll do a little bit of our intro. As I mentioned, uh, Stacy and I work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we're a startup based in San Francisco, London, Berlin, Colorado, and New York, and uh, as well as distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO and founding CTO were the ones who created the technology and the company around RabbitMQ and then sold it to VMware and then noticed certain needs in the growing container space and the venturing uh, the growing Kubernetes space as well. And so started working on open source projects that then started coming together into products and our company. We are VC funded by a variety of VCs, uh, ex excluding Excel partners, uh, but I'll also mention we are also uh, funded by Google Ventures, which uh, I point out because uh, it's another part of our commitment to the Kubernetes space. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of our starting projects were open source and really so much of this company uh, is founded on that. Um, we've got engineers and my developer experience team who have created and maintained uh, so many projects. Some of them you might have heard of. WeaveNet was, I think, one of the earliest ones, if not the earliest. Um, we have Flux and Cortex, which are now in the CNCF. Uh, Flux is the project that kind of got us to that place of the famous expression of GitOps, um, doing operations uh, using Git and uh, as a sing uh, having a repo as a single source of truth. Um, and Cortex is built upon Prometheus, so it uh, makes it extendable and scalable. And many, many more like EKS Cuddle, um, Ignite, Scope, etc. Um, and I'll call out Flagger, which is maybe one of our more popular ones these days, which helps you do things like canary deployments, um, blue-green, uh, using uh, really cloud-native and Kubernetes-based um, methodologies. So uh, if you have more questions about these, uh, we have a GitHub page, or you can always reach out to us and ask questions. We have Slack channels uh, for basic, basically every one of these. Well, we also do have products. And um, our first product that we've had for the longest is Weave Cloud. It's a SaaS product that helps you do Kubernetes management, um, metrics, and uh, automated deployments. So in some ways, it's a hosted version of some of the open source bits that we talked about, but of course with a UI and greater integration. So especially integrating the bits from getting metrics from Prometheus and having that be used for doing your automated deployments. Um, Weave Cloud is the product that helps do that. Um, plus, if you want to use Prometheus, um, but you don't want to set it up or maintain it, and most importantly, store the data, um, it's a great solution. 
Uh, we also have our newer product, which we call Weave Kubernetes Platform, and that's actually um, the productizing of the layer that we created for Weave Cloud. So Weave Cloud actually runs on Kubernetes on AWS. And so when we were selling Weave Cloud, a lot of people um, asked us for additional help and wanting to get started. So we thought, okay, maybe it makes sense to offer some consulting and training as well as productizing the layer that we created. And since by that time, GitOps had really taken off, we make sure that it's a very GitOps aware enterprise platform. So it's not just about getting started and up and running with Kubernetes, but being able to have baked in GitOps aware um, capabilities on an enterprise level. So if you have any questions about that, you can feel free to reach out to us. If this is the first time you've seen us, this is our website, weave.works. So check us out and uh, let us know if you're interested in any of those. So thanks for listening. Uh, now we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. If you just joined, like I said, we have a great guest from Rantis, Jason Epstein. Uh, if you haven't come to these before, these usually last about 45 minutes. They can be as short as 30, um, but usually around hover around 45. If you guys have burning questions and we go over time, then we do go over with a hard, hard stop at 60 minutes at the end of the hour. Um, and we're using the platform called Zoom. So if you have questions, please ask them in the chat. Uh, hopefully you can find the chat box if you don't see the button for it. Um, it's usually on the top left corner of your screen, or um, if you hit escape, that will get you out of full screen mode and you can see the Zoom capabilities a little bit better. So hopefully you can find that. Um, we've chatted with Jason. Jason prefers to have questions at the end. So please feel free to um, add your questions in the chat and then we'll address them at the end of his talk. So with that, I will hand it over to Jason. Let, let me know if you need me to stop sharing first. Okay, so first of all, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, hello, uh, I'm Jason Epstein. I'm from Morantis, and I've been in the application modernization space for several years and gotten in, got, I've gotten into containers a few years ago as well. Uh, I joined Docker Incorporated just a little over a year ago. Um, and in November, Morantis acquired uh, the Docker Enterprise piece of Docker. So that included me and several of my, many of my coworkers and the products we sell. So uh, today we focus on uh, the, Docker, the Docker Enterprise engine, the uh, UCP, which is the universal control plane, which is your management plane for orchestrating, uh, for handling your Kubernetes clusters and your swarm clusters, and basically having visibility into your, into your production and test environments. Uh, and then of course, we, we uh, include in the platform is DTR, Docker Trusted Registry. Uh, that's a repository that uh, helps you enforce image security and is a place for uh, you to share images. It handles both Linux and Windows images uh, scans them both for vulnerabilities, allows image signing, which I'll get into later in this talk, and is a way for you to share your images uh, among your uh, among coworkers. Um, I got to speaking with Stacy uh, uh, Stacy Potter uh, last year uh, in the fall, and she asked me to do a presentation that would be relevant to enterprises uh, that are using that are using containers and or or interested in using containers and are interested in this space. Um, so, I am going to talk about image security, I'm primarily focused on image vulnerability scanning and uh, image signing, uh, basically how you can ensure the images that you, uh, that, that every image is what exactly what you think it is. So, first of all, let's, um, this is me, uh, that's what I look like. This is our Mirantis, this is the Mirantis bear, that's our mascot. And Mirantis, we focus on modernizing applications and enterprise scale. So the first thing we offer is a Docker enterprise platform that I just spoke about. And the other thing is the Mirantis cloud platform that is based on OpenStack. And through that, we can, you can either uh, get it from us and deploy it yourself and manage it yourself, or we can fully manage it. So that means we handle things like maintenance and patching and upgrades from everything from your, from your, from your, um, cluster orchestration and container engine all the way on down, uh, we can offer a managed service. We also offer professional services around anything you need us to build, your DevOps pipeline or, or de just getting your stuff deployed into production or whatever you need. So a little bit about me, <clears throat> I'm, I consider myself a passionate containerist. 
So if we're up to me, everything would run in a container. Okay, maybe there's some exceptions, but pretty much everything. Uh, and so, you know, a little over a year ago when I had the opportunity to come to Docker and focus on it full time, it was kind of hard for me to resist. Uh, I'm, an also, I'm also an avid runner. So this photo is of me finishing a race up in uh, Sacramento, California, just uh, late last year. Um, and I'm also an official pacer for the San Francisco Marathon. So I, I do a lot of running. And then I love my local craft beer. Uh, one of my favorite breweries down here in San Jose, where I live, is the Strike Brewery. And um, if, you've ever been, if you've never been there, uh, I suggest, especially if you like really malty, strong beers, they have a really great barley wine. Now, despite the name, it's not actually a wine, it's a beer, but it's like 10 or 11% alcohol, and it's awesome. But after a couple of those, I suggest you have someone else drive you home. So today, we are going to focus on securing your container images and how we're going to do that. And we're going to talk a little bit about image vulnerability scanning, uh, and we're going to talk about image signing, so basically ensuring image provenance from one stage to the next. And we're going to take a little bit of a, a, a glimpse into some of the products that are available out on the market. And then we'll do a demo of signing and scanning using DTR, a Dr. Trusted Registry. Uh, that's the product that we at Mirantis sell. Um, again, I'm not really here to sell you any specific products. Um, generally, my, my goal here is to educate you and hope you learn something. Uh, whatever product, there's a few products out there that do scanning and signing, and uh, I suggest you use one of them. So, some of you might know this photo. This is from a 1990 commercial for Canon cameras starring tennis star Andre Agassi. Uh, Andre Agassi was, was a celebrity of his time, um, very known for, very well known for being very concerned about his image. And the tagline for this commercial for Canon cameras was, image is everything. Now, I think Andre was actually predicting the importance of container images 20 years later. So if image is everything, let's keep it secure. So that's what we're gonna focus on for this talk. So first, what is a Docker container image? So this is an important concept. So many of you already know what it is, but um, for those who don't, here's a little bit more of a technical definition. But ultimately, it's the blueprint for your running applications. An image by itself doesn't run, but you have an, a, a container engine like Docker that will run it as a container. And the image instructs Docker what to do, how to do it. Um, and another thing is it's shareable. So this is important because basically it's, it's all of your dependencies, all your application code uh, packaged into one unit that can be shared from a developer to your CI tool, to a test tool, to a security tool, and eventually into production. And it ensures consistency, portability, scalability, and, and agility for organizations. <clears throat> so typically, uh, just kind of to look at it, the, um, the very bottom kernel, that's not part of the image, but the base layer is, that's gonna be all your dependencies, all your parts of the uh, you know, OS layer that's not the kernel. Um, and then above that, you'll have your layers of uh, various libraries and dependencies. It could be something like um, uh, your uh, uh, code interpreter if you're running Node a Node.js application or Python. Uh, could be some um, libraries that you need for some functions. And then the very top layers is usually the application that the developer will write and, and the configuration information. So, the, um, if we're going to be using images, we need to make sure they're secure. And so one really important thing, or a very important aspect of this, is to make sure you're using your defense, a multi-layered defense. And so you want to know what's inside your apps. Uh, you want to know where the apps came from. You want to know who modified them. All of this is so that you can ensure your apps are safe to run. And I'll get into a little bit later in this talk about why all that matters and what all that means. Um, I really like this quote from Gartner. Uh, from their publication, Best Practices for Running Containers and Kubernetes in Production. And they say, developer use of older vulnerable versions is one of the leading causes of container vulnerabilities. That means that sometimes developers use out of date layers in their container images that have vulnerabilities, that have um, security risks, and, uh, and when they're not using the latest version or at least a version that has patches, uh, it could lead your organization to um, 
to exposures. You don't want that. So why is image security important? Why, are vulnerab why do vulnerabilities matter? Well, this is an example of one vulnerability from May of last year. Uh, all these vulnerabilities that are discovered are, are labeled with, uh, starting with CVE, that's um, common vulnerabilities and exposures, that's what that stands for, followed by the year and then a number. And basically what happens here is when the required conditions are met, uh, a user who doesn't necessarily have, who who's, has maybe low level, not, not root access, can elevate themselves to root in, if they have access to your container and become, and become root. And that's especially bad if you have uh, a container that has um, maybe uh, your um, certificates or private keys mounted on a volume that's only accessible to root uh, or secrets or a um, root only connection to a database. Someone who, can, who exploits this vulnerability can steal all that information uh, and put your, uh, your organization at risk. Uh, you probably don't want that. Uh, then they could also, if they root access, they can take down your application. They can disconnect uh, these, um, these stores uh, and basically prevent your application from working correctly. <clears throat> so when we think of the software delivery lifecycle, um, we commonly compare it to a traditional supply chain that you'll have in manufacturing. So at the very left, you'll have your raw materials that will go to a factory. In the factory, there'll be um, some process will be performed and they'll be assembled into a piece of furniture, in this case, a chair. That then goes to a store uh, where they'll put, uh, maybe they'll put a price tag on it, maybe put it uh, on a shelf or on display. And then someone like you or me will go into the store and buy the chair and we're the end consumer who is taking advantage of this product that's been produced. The software supply chain is very similar. In that case, the developer will create the raw materials, the code, uh, they'll check it into a repository like Git. Uh, then you'll have a CI tool uh, like Jenkins or Spinnaker or something like that, that'll build it uh, and create a container image and push it out to test. Then some, some testing will be done on it. Uh, and if that passes, it'll move on to staging. And if that all passes uh, from checks, it'll move on to production. So the, um, when you have this process in place, you want to make sure that everything is secure. You want to have locks between every stage because um, a very common attack vector is for a hacker to insert an image with malware later in the pipeline, maybe after the security test has been done or maybe directly into production. Uh, and you want to prevent that. You want to make sure that what's being run in production is the same image that was built by your CI tool and has also gone through all the needed checks. So the, um, and so with that, you want to have, you want to basically have each stage gated and, um, and, multi and the solutions that I talk about, uh, most of them will, will do that for you. So image scanning uh, or image vulnerability scanning specifically. So these are, this is a way that you can, uh, these are tools, uh, tools that do this, will scan your images layer by layer and determine if there is any known vulnerabilities, such as the one I showed you earlier with the, um, uh, the, the ability for the user to elevate themselves to root. Uh, it'll scan your image for vulnerabilities. Now vulnerabilities can come into play, you know, maybe someone, um, it could be sometimes intentional, but most of the time it's unintentional. Most of the time it's just an exposure and an exploit that someone figured out from existing software, just an error in the software, something that wasn't considered. Um, and you wanna find all this out before you deploy it to your production cluster. The other thing that you want to focus on is image content trust. Uh, this is your, your image provenance. Basically you're ensuring that at every stage, the image is what you think it is. Um, you want to make sure no one's injected a um, substituted a, a malware into the pipeline uh, without you expecting it. No one's modified it. No one's tampered with it. And the way we do this, we, the way we ensure this is every stage signs the image with their own crypto signature. So first uh, Jenkins or your CI tool could sign it with their own signature. Then the security solution could sign it again with their signature and staging and so on. And then in production, there's um, a lot of these tools. Um, 
<clears throat> Morantis says UCP is one of them, and there's other solutions that do this, that will check that every required signature is in the product. Uh, if any of them are missing, it won't run it uh, in the cluster, it'll block it. So um, let's uh, talk about some of the solutions in the marketplace. Um, and of these solutions, some are open source and free to use. Uh, some are enterprise and uh, provide you the benefits of, of, ent of enterprise solutions. You know, they offer support, they offer additional features that are, re that are needed, that are relevant to enterprises. And you'll have to, you know, for you, it's up to you and your organization to decide what makes the most sense for you, what uh, is most effective for and what's going to meet your needs. And there's a few here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, in the middle is Aqua, and Aqua is a very good one. Aqua is very fast. If you have lots and lots of images that, you know, need to be deployed quickly, Aqua is a very quick uh, vulnerability scanner. Um, Twistlock uh, is now owned by Palo Alto Networks, and Palo Alto Networks is widely known for their um, network security, and Twistlock is going to um, be really great for augmenting that. It's very commonly used. Um, JFrog's X-Ray is an add-on for Artifactory. And Artifactory, besides being a repository for containers, container images, uh, also handles um, other, uh, other types of images, other types of artifacts. And X-Ray can scan things besides just container images, other types of images. And that's uh, pretty useful. Um, Docker Trusted Registry, which is what I'm going to focus on, uh, is part of the Docker Enterprise platform. So when you buy the platform, this comes as part of it. It's very tightly integrated into UCP, uh, where you'll actually run your images in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it also um, scans both Windows and Linux images. Um, it can live on-prem or in the cloud if you decide to deploy it there, uh, or on a VM or wherever you want. Um, and it does binary level scanning, so uh, at each layer. So if you were to change some of the metadata or change the name of, of a layer, it'll still um, recognize it uh, when it does its vulnerability scanning. So I'm going to focus on DTR, Docker Trusted Registry. And this is kind of the steps the scanner takes to, uh, to, achieve, to accomplish a scan. So the first thing it'll do is um, it'll inspect the image. It'll get the image's layers. Um, and it'll discover, uh, you know, the components that make it up. And it'll basically almost reconstruct the original Docker file that was used to, um, to build it. And from there, it'll generate a bill of materials. Uh, from there, it'll go into a bit-by-bit -bit binary scan, vulnerability scan, of each layer. Um, and it'll compare the hash of that to the U.S. National Vulnerability Database. And figure out what vulnerabilities exist, and, uh, and store all the results, as well as the metadata, and um, additional user-readable details about the metadata, what, the, what it does, how it works, that kind of thing. And then from there, um, it'll, the scan is complete. And you can either, as the user, you can go in and look at it, or you can set up a policy that, uh, an automated policy that takes action based on the results of a scan. Or you can fire off a webhook. A uh, webhook could be, calling an, uh, an external service that performs additional tests on the image or, um, or fires off another part of your pipeline or sends out a notification uh, to you that the scan is complete. So now I'm going to move, now I'm going to go to a demo. Um, so let's get that set up. And uh, we're going to demo uh, Docker Trusted Registry. And let's see. So this is what the, uh, let's go to the repositories. Okay, I'm logged out. I need to log back in. Okay, so this is an interface for the, um, the Docker Trusted Registry. These are, these are the different repositories available uh, here. Think of these as, as buckets, buckets that will store your container images. Um, so we can look at each of them and see there's a Postgres one, uh, here's some of your tags, and um, each of these stores some images. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to push, well, I'm going to look at the uh, some images that I have, and I 
am going to, I have a lot of uh, container images on here, and I'm just going to focus on Nginx. Um, for whatever reason, people are always picking on Nginx. Who knows why, but I will do the same. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a really old version of Nginx, 1.7.9. That's like more than five years old. Um, it's old. It has a lot of vulnerabilities, but I'm using it to make a point. So I've actually tagged it uh, ahead of time uh, with this, and that that's just kind of it's the same as it's the same um, image ID as the one that you pull from Docker Hub. Um, but I'm going to use this and push it up to my my DTR, which I've already logged into. So if I do a Docker push uh, 1.7.9, it'll push this up. And now it's pushed it to my repository. It'll be in here and it will receive its vulnerability scan. And we see here it is, it's already been scanned and it has 48 vulnerabilities. That's a lot. So um, I'm going to look at this, and then we'll after this we'll we'll see uh, one that has fewer vulnerabilities, and see how you can you can use an automated policy to promote it from one point in your pipeline to the next, and then I'll demonstrate image scanning or image signing. So we can look at the details of of this, and what we see is basically a reconstructed Docker file here. Um, this will resemble it pretty closely, and I can drill into seeing exactly what my vulnerabilities are. And of my 48 critical vulnerabilities, uh, there are 19 of them in glibc. That's a, a required library for lots of applications. From here, we see that this specific vulnerability has a severity of 10. Severities are from 0 to 10. 0 is actually not a vulnerability at all. Um, if it's like 0.1 or 0.2, it's pretty minor. 10 is the worst it could possibly be. This is a really bad severity. And what happens here? is if you run this uh, in your environment, um, some attacker can um, uh, call, uh, basically exercise the get host by name function, which is why it gets nicknamed the ghost vulnerability, and essentially cause a buffer overflow and gain remote access to your machine. Uh, that's pretty bad. If I click on it, I can actually drill a little bit further down into it and I get to miter.org where I can get more information of it about it. Um, I see several blog posts that discuss what this does, how it works, you know, what the consequences are. Um, then I can go a little bit further and go to um, nist.gov, where we get a little bit more of the detail. Um, and here we have uh, severity, or I'm sorry, the version three and two, both are widely used in the industry. Since my, uh, I have it set up for version two right now, um, that's what I'm going to look at. And I see my vector. This is basically tells you about the severity, a little bit more about the severity of this um, of this vulnerability. And this doesn't really make a lot of sense to most of us, AV colon N, AC colon L. But if I hover over it, I can see what this all means. Um, in the lower section, we can see AV colon N is attack vector, is network. So that means that a hacker can actually access this from the public network, the internet. They don't have to be logged into the machine itself. They don't have to even be on the local subnet. They can be out on the internet. That's pretty bad. Uh, the attack complexity is low. That means it's not complex to execute this exploit. Uh, you, it's not, and, and it's not that difficult. Um, the authentication is none. They don't have to have existing credentials. They don't have to be logged in. Um, and then the impacts are confidential, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. All those are complete breaches. And there's an explanation of what all that means below, where it says, um, under additional information, where it says, uh, basically, for confidentiality, it allows unauthorized disclosure of information. Uh, for integrity, it allows unauthorized modification. And for availability, it allows disruption of service. So in a nutshell, this attack is easy to execute. Uh, it, and it has very wide ranging impact. Um, that's all bad. So in a nutshell, I recommend you not run this version of Nginx, uh, anywhere in your environment and definitely not production. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to, um, create a promotion policy, uh, and I'm going to push a little bit newer version of Nginx. 
and I'm going to and my policy is actually going to do this automated scan, uh, vulnerability scan, and if it meets a certain criteria, then I will advance this image from, say, um, this is just a developer repo to my uh, to my UAT repo. So it, basically, it's saying it's passed that check, that passed that initial test, and now it can um, proceed to uh, user acceptance testing uh, in my in my tool chain in my pipeline. So I'm going to say uh, critical vulnerabilities have to be less than or equal to 20. And this is pretty extreme. If you have 20 critical vulnerabilities, that's actually a lot. You might want to be much more stringent than this. But I'm just doing this to, um, for an example. So I set up my namespace there and Nginx UAT. So Nginx UAT is a different repository that um, uh, that is going to be only images that have passed this vulnerability scanning test and met this criteria. So I'll save that. Um, and now I will push version 1.15.4. This version is much newer. This version is from a couple of years ago. Uh, it still has some vulnerabilities. It's still uh, a little bit out of date, but it's much better. So it's pushed it there. And now I can, if I go to my repositories and look at the UAT uh, repo, um, I can see that what I just pushed has uh, has been promoted to this repository. Um, and uh, it has only 14 critical vulnerabilities, which is still a lot, not as bad as uh, 1.7.9. Okay. So the last thing I am going to do is show you image signing. Uh, so for that, um, I'm going to first turn on Docker content trust. And I set this environment variable to let the system know that I'm going to be using Docker content trust, which is uh, how I sign my images and push it. And I know that it's been uh, an authorized image from me and uh, and how this, how DTR can ensure that it really did come from me and hasn't been tampered with. So the next thing is Docker trust sign. And I'm going to sign this. And this is going to be the latest uh, Nginx. So the first thing I'm do, going to do is sign it. So I've, before this demo, um, I actually, uh, my password, before this demo, I had already, um, generated my private key uh, and created my certificate. And so now all I'm doing is adding my signature to this image that's basically verifying that this image, I approve of it, um, I'm accepting it, and, uh, and you know it came from me. So now uh, I am going to do a Docker push of this image that I just signed. And so it's going to push it. I can put in my password again. And let me go over to my repository where I will see the image. This is the one I just pushed, uh, the latest tag from Nginx, and it's been signed. So that's really important because now we've noted that it has a valid signature on it. So what can I do with all this? Well. Let's go back to uh, to the deck, and kind of go through that. Sorry. So, in the um, so, what we can do is this is um, there's a lot of tools that do this. Um, Docker uh, UCP or Barantis uh, Universal Control Plane is one such tool, and this is a setting where we are enforcing uh, signed that that we're only going to run images that have been signed by these groups. So we're requiring a signature from someone from the developers team, someone from the QA team, and someone from the security testers team. And if any of those signatures are missing, we're going to block it. We're not going to run it in our production cluster. Um, so this is a way of ensuring that every image is exactly what we think it is, 
Uh, it hasn't been uh, tampered with. It hasn't been substituted by with with like malware or something else. Um, and it's it's a way to enforce uh, content trust. So, just some your takeaways. What you um, what this all means. Uh, just my 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 uh, my points of advice is scan your images for vulnerabilities. So um, you want to know what risks you're up against. Okay, and when you get your scan results, you can set up an automated. Uh, filtered like I have, if you have a tool that does it, that will say fewer than, you know, you might even want to say no critical vulnerabilities, only then will I uh, pass it to the next phase. Um, but the decision is purely up to your organization. And then also when you do get some vulnerabilities, you might want to look at them um, and determine whether they really are risks for you. So for instance, maybe you have, um, maybe there's a vulnerability in one of your images where if a user uh, connects to your web server through port 80, through with unencrypted traffic, they can do some bad things, but maybe you have a firewall in front of it that blocks all traffic to port 80. Um, so while it's still something of a risk because if they were to get around the firewall or someone from inside the network were to access it, you have that issue, but it's not as major of a risk as if, you're, if you uh, allowed users from the internet to just access that port. Just an example. So you wanna scan every image and assess the risk for whenever you see vulnerabilities and you I showed you some places where you can do research on them and figure out what it all means. You also want to have some automatic image filtering and gating so that uh, that that is configured to meet your security criteria so that um, only images that meet your criteria get moved to the next stage in production or next stage in your pipeline. Um, then the next thing is you want to sign your images at each phase. Uh, and you should require this uh, for any um, repositories or CI tools or security tools or test tools. Any step in your pipeline should cryptographically sign the image and ultimately ensure that all the required signatures are in place before you run it in production. Uh, and again, there's automated tools out there that will do this, that will check for this and will prevent images that have not been signed from running in production. So that's kind of it. Um, and uh, now I can take questions. Fantastic. That was really helpful. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned, thanks for all of you joined. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, we had said that we'd take questions at the end. So I'll start by reading a few that came in during the talk. So um, one of the middle questions was, um, if images are immutable, why do we need to sign it? And he said, sorry for the naive question. There are no dumb questions here, but thanks for asking. <laughs> no, that's a, really, that's a really great question. Um, so there's a couple things. First of all, um, someone can add layers on top of an image. That's one of the things. Uh, and you know, anytime you have an image, you could always, you, you could, through your Docker file or Kubernetes YAML or Docker Compose file, you can add images on top of it uh, to it. And the layers you add on top of it might do some bad things. That's one thing. The other thing is you can substitute it out for something that has malware. And that's actually a very common attack. Um, sometimes, so you'll see, actually, if you go up on Docker Hub, you'll see, uh, you'll see your standard images like Nginx or Postgres or MySQL uh, or Node.js, just your, your, your normal verified images. And then you'll also see some kind of other versions that someone has pushed uh, and called it the same name. Um, in a lot of cases, those are safe. That's just a developer adding their own pieces on top of it, maybe recompiling the source code and pushing their own version. But sometimes those are actually, um, that's actually malware masquerading as a valid image. Uh, and so you want to sign it so that you, you want to have it signed so that uh, at each stage you can verify that what you're running uh, is exactly what you think it is. And no one substituted it for something else or added layers on top of it uh, and and basically uh, ultimately could compromise your system. No, that's a really good question. Excellent. Um, another question we have, uh, well, I'll swap it around a little bit. Um, does the trusted registry only scan the distribution packages such as RPM and DEB um, or does it also scan vulnerabilities in software installed by PIP, NPM, GPN, or manually? Okay, so 
Uh, yes. So let's see. So let's see. So let me so, read this. Does it question. only scan distribution packages or uh, does it also uh, scan for things that you've um, installed manually or through things like NPM? Right. Um, it's the latter. So anything that is in your container image, it will scan. And that will include uh, software that was installed, um, you know, either, either automatically from a script or your Docker file or manually. Um, and then also packages that you've included. Um, if you've pulled in, say, uh, as your base image, Debian or, or one of the Alpine images uh, or, um, or, or any other um, base image, it'll scan all that. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so basically it does scan for vulnerabilities of both, both types, yeah. packages and, okay. Yeah, that's good to know because I think some only do like packages. Um, we have another question. How do you manage CVEs that are not going to be addressed? Uh, he adds a link and uh, said, I'm personally, I'm having trouble justifying that certain images are quote unquote safe for use in my company. And uh, I'll have to see the link here, but it's. Uh, right. So, so without actually going to that link, um, uh, it looks like, why does my security scanner show that an image has so many CVEs? And I think, I think what the question is asking, um, how do I deal with false positives? Um, I'm guessing that's the intent of the question. Um, basically, uh, their security scanner showed a bunch of vulnerabilities. Um, some of them are fine. Some of them aren't really risks. And some of them are actually real vulnerabilities. Um, but the false positives, the ones that show up as vulnerabilities that are not actually issues, uh, he's saying are safe for use in his company. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a very common uh, issue and concern that a lot of people uh, have to deal with. So one of the things that you can do is um, a lot of these tools, uh, Docker Trusted Registry is one of them, allow you to dismiss a um, a vulnerability. Uh, that you know doesn't affect your, um, doesn't uh, actually impact your environment. Um, the example I gave were, you know, uh, you know, uh, for port 80, or maybe there's um, a certain library is, uh, has um, vulnerabilities and you know that no applications are using that library. Uh, or maybe you have a way of coding around it, maybe um, coding your application so that it kind of covers any gaps. Um, uh, in that case, uh, you know that these are false positives. Um, so what you can do is in these tools, you would dismiss the vulnerability as, um, as being something that you've already dealt with, something that you're aware of, something that you know is not going to impact your organization or your environment. Um, and then probably add some notes in the readme, uh, basically saying, I dismissed this, this is why, and blah, 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 blah whatever information you need. And then for future vulnerability scans, that will no longer show up. Uh, so that's kind of a way of dealing with it. Um, and, and yeah, we, this is a very common issue. Cool. Um, sorry, let me just paste this in here. Uh, reminder to everybody, if you ask a question, uh, please uh, send it to all panelists and attendees. I'll repaste it here. So the question is, can DTR be installed on-prem or air-gapped environment? Um, does it come packaged standalone or has lots of dependencies? And I guess the follow-up question there is also, is DTR available as a container image? Okay. So yeah, these are, these are, that, this is a very good question. And actually this is um, something that I, I, I work with a lot of our larger customers in the Bay area and many of them have air gapped environments and have, and, and have this exact scenario. So yeah. Um, first of all, DTR is available as a container image. It's an enterprise product, so you're not going to find it on Docker Hub. Uh, I mean, it's it's not something that you can. I mean, you can find it there, but uh, it requires a purchase license to to work. Um, but the what 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 you would do is there's there's actually two parts for making DTR work in an air gapped environment. One is uh, you would need to download it on a machine that does have access to the internet. Uh, secondly. Uh, you would um, you can tar that image up as as uh, you can export it from Docker as a tar file, and then you would move it over to the AirGap system, um, you know via you know USB drive or if if you have a network connection to it or or however you move um, data from or, or applications from the connected machine to the AirGap machine. 
And then you do a Docker load, which is basically pulling a, a tar file on your hard drive, uh, basically imported into, into Docker as an image. Uh, and then you can run it um, and, and it is a container image. Uh, the other thing is you need to do the same thing with your vulnerability database. So that's something that gets downloaded uh, once per day and uh, updated and it's important to keep that up to date. Um, air-gapped customers, and we have several who are doing this, uh, need to do the same thing uh, with, with um, pulling down the, the, um, the database, the, the national vulnerability or the US National Vulnerability Database that has all the known vulnerabilities uh, from, a, from a machine that has internet connectivity and then moving the, uh, the file as a tarball over to uh, somewhere that DTR can access and then importing it there. So yeah, this is great question, very relevant case. Awesome. Um, are there any last questions? We're kind of coming to the uh, winding down point, but if you have any last ones, I actually was curious, um, do you, without naming names, I guess in some cases, do you have a, a real life example um, where uh, people had outdated images and had a really bad situation that maybe you were there to help with? Or? Well, so I can tell you about, uh, this was, um, so fortunately um, our, uh, I, I'm pretty, I pretty strongly advocate all of our customers scan their images, sign their images, keep their vulnerability databases up to date, run every image through DTR, um, and make sure that that everything is um, is up to date. But yeah, there 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 still will be vulnerabilities that you know if customers haven't kept things up to date, or a vulnerability was just discovered and they haven't had a chance and it hasn't been patched yet. Uh, we we certainly have had customers that we actually had a, one of our large financial customers. Um, they, we don't, it hasn't, act, it didn't get exploited that anyone knows of, so that's good, but they knew of this, um, uh, this vulnerability and scrambled to, um, to patch it. Uh, and fortunately there was a patch available and they had to apply it. Um, but actually there was, this is, um, not something that I've worked with directly, but there was uh, an NPM attack a few years ago, basically, uh, what's it called? Flat mapper, uh, event stream. Um, was was a library used in uh, for Node.js applications, and basically, some, one of the contributors to actually was end up being the owner of the um, of the uh, of the package on GitHub, um, or, or someone who was able to convince the original owner to let him take control of it, and he injected malware into it, and basically this and and so this was an official image that people were downloading and it contained malware. And basically what this was doing is um, anyone, certain kinds of um, Bitcoin wallets, it would uh, basically steal their private keys and account information and send that out to, uh, to a hacker's server. So all this information was getting stolen and, um, and not just information, but Bitcoin currency was getting stolen. Yeah. Um, so this was, you know, a really bad, vulnerability, uh, one of the more egregious examples. Yes, um, that is very interesting. And uh, we do have one follow-up question. Uh, do you also report newly published vulnerabilities in images that were already scanned in the past and are available for downloads? Yeah, and oh good, you know, we, we've got some really good questions here. I appreciate this. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a point that I should have brought up. Uh, there's actually two things that are changing constantly in your, uh, in your container images. One is new images are getting pushed by developers uh, or they might update their Docker file or compose or Kubernetes YAML to include the latest version or a newer version. Um, and you need to scan the newer versions because uh, the old version, the, whatever the results are for the old version is out of date. So you need to constantly scan that. The other thing is new vulnerabilities are constantly being found in in existing container images uh, that are already in production, already in your pipeline. And that's why you wanna be frequently updating, uh, pulling down the latest version of the, the US National Vulnerability Database, uh, which um, these, all these tools let you do. Uh, and that will contain um, any newly discovered vulnerabilities in images that exist already. Um, so in some cases, you might need to pull something out of production. Um, that's kind of the worst case scenario, but or actually the worst case scenario is getting uh, exploited. But 
The second worst case is having to pull something out of production and, and having to um, uh, patch it or put in an older version that doesn't have that exploit, uh, which is always time consuming and complicated to do. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, DTR uh, continually rescans existing images uh, for checking for newly discovered vulnerabilities. Awesome. Well, I'm going to share my. Well, I have one more slide. Oh, you have one more slide. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So this is just uh, some information. Um, just how to contact us. Um, here's my LinkedIn profile. And um, uh, Stacy and Tama will uh, share the slide deck after the, uh, after the, after the webinar is over. And um, if you want to contact Mirantis for just, uh, if you're curious about our products, or if you want a demo, here's the links to do that. Um, so uh, thanks a lot for listening. So you now awesome. you talking about. Yes, and uh, Stacey will be sending out emails, I think in my name, uh, with various links, as he mentioned. Um, and yes, these are recorded. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, and so we'll be having the link for that as well. So thank you for that. I'll share our closing slide. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is um, uh, something that we do on Tuesdays, uh, every other Tuesday for this season. Uh, we have some upcoming talks. Uh, next one is on the flagger updates, which is very exciting. And also, uh, if you're new, we've got um, a Slack channel. If you have further questions on uh, any of this, and uh, you know, if you forget Jason's link, we can forward you to you. Uh, and then our meetup.com page is pretty much the best place to find our calendar for future events. Uh, and uh, we've got other things we'll include in the email that uh, we have a GitOps uh, challenge and hand up handbook if you have any other general interest in GitOps, because you know that um, that's what we sell here. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm really uh, thankful for Jason on this topic, because in terms of security in general, too, um, we're noticing a, a ramp up on hacking activities, phishing, all kinds of things. So please, uh, yeah, be safe, be aware, um, keep your uh, family members who are ten tend to be vulnerable to those uh, uh, well informed as well, <laughs> not click on really bad links. Um, again, I hope you guys are all staying safe. Thanks for joining. Thanks for your awesome questions. Thanks to Jason as well and Stacy. So I'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>